I can see. Great. Welcome everyone to today's Cultivating Success webinar. We're really excited to have a, a great presentation on wireworms. So this is essentially an online field day. This webinar program is supported by Cultivating Success. The Cultivating Success program was developed in 2000 by University of Idaho Extension, Washington State University Food Systems and Extension Program, and the Small Acreage Farming Nonprofit Organization, Rural Roots. This is our fourth year of doing webinars, so you may have been on one before, but if not, let me give you a couple of webinar tips. We're all still sharing a lot of bandwidth, so if at any time you have trouble, you might wanna close the other programs that are running on your computer. You might check your sound. If at any time it's slow, it's choppy, crackly, please type into the chat box and myself and my colleague Mackenzie Lawrence are happy to provide some technical assistance, let you know if the sound problems are on your side or on the side of the speaker. At any time, you can switch from computer to telephone sound. And so if you do that, just mute your computer so you don't get feedback. The call-in number is in your welcome email. We will have time for Q&A with our presenters. So please type your questions for the presenters into the Q&A box. So both the Q&A box and the chat box are in the control bar at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A box is definitely easy for us to keep track of your questions. And again, technical assistance is how we use the chat. This webinar is being recorded and is going to be available with a handout of the slides on the Cultivating Success website tomorrow. At the end of the webinar, I will show you where you can find that information. Again, we have four, um, or sorry, we have three great present presenters today. Diane Green with Green Tree Naturals in Sandpoint, Idaho is the farmer that has hosted this research project and she's going to be our first speaker. Then Dr. Arash Rashed, is a professor of entomology, plant pathology, and nematology at University of Idaho, and he will be our second speaker, joining us right at the end of Diane's presentation. And then Atutha Nikokar, who is a PhD student in the Department of Entomology, Plant Pathology, and Nematology at University of Idaho, will be our third speaker. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to you, Diane. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a fun way to, to have lunch together. Um, for those of you that don't know me or Green Tree Naturals, we have two and a half acres in production here in Sandpoint, and we grow about 90 different types of vegetables along with herbs and garlic and cut flowers. And we started uh, doing seed crops a couple of years ago for Snake River Seeds. So that's a, a new endeavor for us. I thought I'd do an overview of our farm. That, that circle there is our herb garden. So um, looks some people say it looks like an alien landing strip, but it's, it's not. <laughs> Our, our mission is to build community by offering educational opportunities, utilizing organic and sustainable farming techniques and be a model of good land stewardship and provide nutritious certified organic produce to our local community. We've been providing a place for organic gardening workshops, hands-on learning through agricultural related activities and mentorships on our farm for the past 25 years. And we are one of the oldest certified organic farms in the region. We're com very committed to forging partnerships with other farmers and educators and working together to create a more sustainable future for our community. Next, please. We started doing on-farm on research a number of years ago and um, it's just a, a, a wonderful opportunity for us to learn. We always learn so much. And I think it's really important for research projects to be duplicated on working farms. Universities around the country are responding with new undergraduate and graduate and research programs in organic farming and sustainable agriculture more, more than ever before, which is fantastic. 
We've successfully collaborated on research projects with students, faculty, and university extension educators from the University of Idaho, Washington State, and Montana State Universities over the years. And we found that even after 30 years of farming, there is so much to learn. Next, please. These are just a, um, a few of the projects that we've done. I've served as producer advisor on several research projects over the past 12 years, which is how long we've been doing research projects. In this role, I provide suggestions on experimental design, uh, help identify other farmer collaborators, provide space on our farm for research and assist as needed and to organize on-farm field days at our farm or other locations as, as that comes up. I'm often directly involved with the grant development of funding research projects because the students, so often the graduate students that are doing this, it's, it's a part of their work study and, and they need to generate funding to be able to do what they do and, and um, write their papers. And that's an important aspect of it. And um, sometimes as a farmer, we receive some some compensation for our involvement and sometimes we don't so it's not something that we do particularly for an income we do it for an education to provide an educational opportunity for students at the university and uh, it, it's important to meet the needs of the farmers that are involved um, the the different projects I and mean, every time we do something I, I learned so much and it's, it's benefited us in, in great, um, great ways to help us manage what we're doing in a more sustainable way. And I certainly encourage you, if you are a farmer, to consider being involved in a, in a research project. And part of that would be to tie in with the local extension educator wherever you are. I don't know if everybody's from Sanborn. I suspect from you're from different places. But if you're a student, also um, reaching out to a local farm because it's important that the projects are duplicated on the farm and in uh, university setting. Next slide, please. This Usually, I mean, the, the farm days, I, having a, uh, an on-farm field day has just been a highlight over, over the years for us. And I, and I wish you could be here for that. I wish we could have done this last summer because it's really a wonderful opportunity for graduate students to be able to share here on the farm and um, then be able to go out in the fields and take a close look at what's going on. This is Joyce Parker, who completed her doctorate with WSU and went on to the national to be a national program leader at the U.S. Department of Ag in Washington D.C. We've we've actually kept in touch over the years. She was here in 2009, and we we love hosting these on-farm field days and educational events, and the, it provides the perfect venue for the graduate students to share their research project and. Um, like I said, we always learn so much. Next slide, please. When we've hosted field days at Green Tree Naturals in the past, we usually have it during the peak of the season so we can hire a caterer and prepare a farm fresh luncheon and have some hands-on demonstrations in the gardens. So we wish you were here in person today, although it's not the peak of the season. Everything's still, there's still some snow and ice out there in the gardens, but we'd be happy to share our gardens with you during the summer. If you happen to be in Sandpoint, we usually um, have uh, open farm walks during our, when our farm stand is open on Thursdays, or you can make arrangements to come out and have a, a walkabout in our gardens. And you can see um, on the left there, there's a, a farm tour from a few years ago. And, and it's always fun to have people here. And every gardener likes to show off their, their space. Next slide, please. 
So how we created the perfect storm for wireworms to flourish. Oh boy. Um, we are, like I said, we're certified organic. So we do not, we're very limited to what we can do for uh, pest management. And we use every integrated pest management system that we can come up with. But this, our problems began in 2017. We decided to do an experiment of our own and took a section of the garden out of production to experiment with no-till because I know a lot of young farmers that are doing no-till now and we do minimal tillage but we we thought well let's let's try this so we took out um, six or seven row 100 or 100 foot rows in our garden to uh, experiment with and we had been using a mustard cover crop ever since we did an on-farm research project with WSU using mustard as a catch crop. So we thought we'd try that and we planted a thick crop of mustard and then cut it down and just let it lay for a full year. And then the following year in 2018 we transplanted broccoli seedlings into this no-till area with the goal of growing our first broccoli seed crop. Next slide. And that um, didn't work out so well. I mean, we, we didn't realize until we got all of our seedlings planted that there was an issue there. And within days of transplanting my, my beautiful broccoli seedlings that I had been nurturing for weeks they started to wilt and die. And you can see the photo on the left. Well, even on the left, you can see it starting to wilt. The one on the right, you can see that we um, wrapped the seedling with a newspaper collar, which we use to prevent cutworm damage because we have had cutworms intermittently. And that just keeps them from cutting through the seedling when it's there. And a part of using integrated pest management is really making clear identification of what's damaging your plants. And by the time we discovered that wireworms were eating the roots of the transplant, I had lost, lost over 50% of the 120 seedlings that had been planted out. And you know, part of that was just really looking at it and digging around the sides of it and finally pulling up a plant. And when I pulled it up and, and found all those wireworms in there is um, kind of freaked me out, but um, that's that's kind of the nature <laughs> of finding the pest in the garden. Next slide, please. So we um, commenced to trying to come up with a way of saving, saving the broccoli crop. And um, we had seen, occasionally we'd see wireworms in our carrots, or we might see them in potatoes in the past here and there in different parts of the garden, and have experimented with using um, trap cropping before. And since I, I know the wireworms love carrots, so with the goal of drawing the wireworms away from the remaining broccoli berry babies, I ended up burying, um, I bought a a couple 25 pound bags of certified organic carrots and buried one next to each one of my seedlings. And then about every three days, I'd, I'd go out there and pull the carrot out of the ground, pull the wire worms out of the carrot and put them in a can and then rebury the carrot. And I, I and that was the most expensive time labor sweat equity crop of broccoli we've ever had before, but I was determined to get a seed crop out of it. And I, I barely did. I didn't, I ended up having to call that a crop failure and, and um, just have the seed for ourselves. But it, it was an effort, a futile effort. And as time went by, I finally gave up and um, just called, let that infestation do its thing. And we kind of blocked off that part of the garden and um, somewhere in the interim. Um, next slide, please. I think that's my last slide. 
in the following year in 2019, one of my University of Idaho associates mentioned that Dr. Ashid was looking for locations with wireworm infestations for some studies he was doing. So I contacted him and shared our story with him. And the timing was just perfect for a project with one of his grad that Atusa was working on, one of his graduate students. And uh, in 2019, Atusa came out for a visit to the farm and set some wireworm traps. And after a week after she set the trap, she she came back very excited that because she identified three different species of wireworms and and our our mass infestation was made her very happy. <laughs> so it was good that we were able to to meet that need for the research project that they were doing, and that was the beginning of that's what led us to working on developing a, a research project with the Organic Farming Foundation for this wireworm research project. So I think uh, at, at this point, um, I want to pass this over to Dr. Rashid and Atusa to share their research and outcomes from what happened on our farm. And thanks for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate, I appreciate your sharing your history with on-farm research and the value that you find from on-farm research as a producer. And uh, welcome, Dr. Rashad. Could you please go ahead and share your screen or I can advance the slides for you, whatever your preference is. Uh, thank you. I'm, um, I am trying to, I think I'm trying to just do that now. Uh, I hit yes, there you go. Do you have my screen now? Yes. All right, so yes. let me play this. Perfect. Is it good? Yes. All right, so, well, thank you very much, Dan, for the, for the introduction. So it made my job much easier. Now I don't have to introduce myself, but I think it's good to start with, uh, with a little bit of a slide um, it, about, about soil. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when we talk about soil, we're just talking about the physical attribute of the soil, but the actual term is referring to both biotic and abiotic components of, that we have in the soil. And what we have in there and how we use whatever is available in the soil, it makes a big difference, especially uh, if you're thinking about having a sustainable production in an agricultural system that is organic. Uh, Balancing the interactions in that field makes a big difference. If uh, if the balance between the pests, if it, uh, and the and the beneficials that we have available to them, and also the crop that we are interested in. So, um, the general uh, aim of this uh, research or talk uh, is to bring that importance that you know we have organisms that are pests, but we also have organisms that are of importance for us. Uh, uh, in terms of managing those pests. And we are hoping to be able to build upon those uh, beneficials and be able to knock down the population of a pest that is, is really challenging. So uh, the crop of our interests could be anything. Uh, here, I put an example of a, um, oh, again, I need to activate my pen, a laser pointer. It could be a, it could be a uh, change that to a pen. I like a pen better. It makes me feel like writing old school on a, Oh God, I got to the end of my slide. All right, so here I'm talking crop of interest is actually uh, wheat, I think, or barley that I put in here. I can't see it closely. Uh, you may not know, Idaho has the uh, largest barley, pro barley production in the US. And you may not also know that Idaho also has the largest organic barley production in the US. So uh, it is very important. And that's one of those systems that we are uh, focused on, we are working on, our crop could be uh, a rotation crop, such as mustard, for instance, but mustard is also a crop that we can use to manage these wireworms, and I wanted to put it in this slide here as well. This is a wireworm that uh, you've seen a few photos in Diane's talk, uh, and this is an image uh, that we took of uh, one of those species that uh, we found uh, in organic farm, and it's called Lemonius californicus, and I'm going to loosely refer to it as sugar beet wireworm. It's commonly known as sugar beet wireworm. 
This image here is gonna be the focus of our talk is we're talking about nematodes. These are little teeny tiny organisms that can cause significant uh, damage as pests to crops, but this is not the species that we are working on. Nematodes could also be beneficial. So we are, our focus is just to find those beneficial nematodes that are most effective against wireworms and use them, uh, support their population in fields to, shut, to knock down the population of wireworms. And this photo on the top right corner is actually showing a wireworm that is infested with a fungus, entomopathogenic fungus, um, that um, basically penetrate their body and eventually causes them to die. So now these organisms, some of them, we have them in the field, some of them we could purchase from outside. So, but important thing is that we need to understand how they interact with the pests of our interest and how they interact with that abiotic component of the soil that we have. And that has been the focus of our studies. So let's talk about um, wireworms a little bit. Wireworms are the larval stage of click beetles. We have the click beetles on the right side of this, uh, image uh, that you can see, uh, how you can recognize them. They have these elongated bodies. If you put them on their back, on the palm of your hand, a lot of times they make this click sound and they flick up in the air to start to run away from you. That's how you can tell you're dealing with a, a click beetle. So uh, after they mate, uh, they lay their eggs. The eggs will come out as larvae. We call those uh, larvae of click beetles, wireworms. And the reason that we call them wireworms is because, because they look like wires. They have this hard body that is even hard to crush. So they are pretty hardy insects in the environment. Um, then they go, uh, they can live for several years in the soil. That's the bad news. And I'm gonna be talking about that later. Then they would morph into a uh, pupal stage uh, for a couple of weeks. And then they would emerge as the beetle again. So if you wanna put it in a, into a, a uh, little life cycle image, you would see in our area, this is the time frame that you see, see them start emerging as adults. We have uh, early May, um, April uh, to uh, mid, late May, the adults are, would um, come out from the soil in Northern Idaho and actually uh, most of Idaho, I would say. Um, and then um, they would mate, they lay their eggs, the eggs would hatch, the larvae of a uh, uh, I'm going to focus on sugar beet wireworm now. They can stay in, in the soil for up to five years. Usually it would be three years. The length varies based on the environmental condition. If it's suitable, it would be quicker. It would be within three years. If it's unsuitable, they may go into this inactive mode, not moving, not feeding, and that would extend their larva stage. And then they would emerge as an adult and the cycle would start. They feed on a wide range of crops. Uh, we started by looking at cereals. And the reason that we looked at cereals such as barley, wheat and barley was that there is no effective chemical to reduce their populations. So all we have available to us were some seed treatments. I probably have some slides to talk about it, but it's not of course of interest to uh, this talk today, but I just wanna say that it's not uh, even in, in conventional uh, production systems, this is a challenge that needs to be addressed. So you go out in a big, let's say organic barley field, you will see these big patches of missing plants that is caused by this larvae uh, hitting either the uh, seed or hitting the base of a plant that is emerged. And then the first symptoms that you're seeing is the middle leaf of the plant would die. And here we call that a dead heart. So that's the typical damage they cause. At the field of scale, you see uh, big patches of those missing plants, or you see in a mature field, you will see uh, plants that uh, are yet to be uh, matured within a field that is already ready for harvest. And that's because the plant was hit at later stages uh, after emergence and the, the growth of the plant was delayed. So that's why you will see this pattern. Now, ooh, what happened here? There you go. So now we have uh, these uh, other crops that are affected with wireworms. Uh, here we have a carrot that uh, Dan had a few examples of them. The damage could be direct. So they basically hit the plant that you cannot sell this crop anymore or use it for the matter. Or the damage could be secondary, which means that you have a uh, damaged tissue and then they will provide an opportunity for another pathogen to get in there and cause the infection and basically ruin the crop. So the damage would be both direct and indirect. 
or uh, primary and secondary. So why they became an issue? In old days, we used to control them with some of the chemicals that we don't have the market in the US anymore. Organochlorins, they were like DDT is an example, linden is an example, you, you, I'm sure you heard DDT at least. Those are very effective chemicals knocking down the population of these pests. Now, after decade, almost, we start to, uh, these, uh, the effect of those chemicals are fading away. So think about it, how long those chemicals persisted in the environment to keep the populations down? Until now, after a decade, they start becoming a problem again. So they start becoming a problem again, and now we have to deal with them, but hopefully we won't make the mistake that we made last time to rely on chemicals. We have to have other options, especially when it comes to organic production systems. These adults, they really like grasses uh, and small grains would be a good source for them, good field. We, in a lot of uh, areas that are rain fed, uh, we don't have a proper rotation. Here, it's much better. If you go to Southeastern Idaho, for instance, there are areas that is very dry. So you can only plant wheat and barley over and over again. And that's really not a rotation. And that's just uh, attracting adults. When I say lack of rotation, uh, we may have uh, fields that are pastures that have grasses all the time. And that would be the same thing. You have grasses for many years, it attracts adults, they will lay their eggs. And now if you have your garden, right next to one of those pastures, grassy areas. That's basically where the insects are coming out of and they, they move into the garden and causing damage a lot of times. And then they would lay eggs in the garden and they would stay, uh, stay there. So that would be a source of infestation in the fields. The other issue is that these, of course, they're, they're uh, uh, living in the soil. So you can't really see them unless you set the traps in to identify them, to find them. And the other thing is that up until 10 years ago, uh, most of the studies on wireworms have been focused, uh, have been general. Okay, how can we manage wireworms? And people miss that big picture that wireworms, they actually have multiple species. It's not just wireworm. You know, you, you have insects that are active a part of the season. You have wireworms that are, could be active throughout the season. So if you don't have the knowledge of the species, you don't know what, what type of damage you should expect in your field. And you don't know, any a particular practice uh, you could apply at a certain part of your growing season to reduce the wireworm damage. I want to give you an example. You know, people are uh, saying that, oh, you know, I apply, uh, I'm talking about conventional insects, uh, conventional production systems. They apply a seed treatment and then it doesn't kill the wireworm. Well, maybe you don't have the wireworm that is active when you do your planting. Maybe that's why it didn't work. So it starts wireworm becoming active later on into the season when the chemicals are not there anymore. And that's the same when you're talking about, um, let's say uh, a mustard uh, rotation, or if you wanna cultivate mustard plants into your field, um, uh, disc them in um, after planting. You need to make sure that you do that when the wireworms are active. Otherwise it may not have the effect that you're expecting to see. So we, spent quite a few years uh, looking around, setting these traps out in more than 250 fields by now to see what type of wireworms we have in Idaho. And this study was not just in part of uh, the state, it's just all over the state, including organic fields in, in Northern Idaho. And uh, the most predominant species was the sugar beet wireworm. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a uh, genus Limonius. And I noticed that Atusa put Limonius symphiscatus uh, instead of Limonius californicus on this slide, but it's also applicable because uh, Infiscatus is one of the most common species that we have in Northern Idaho. And these two species are more or less very similar in nature. So if you wanna know how to look for wireworms in your field, here's a publication that I put in there. It takes you on the step-by-step -step how to prepare and uh, uh, look for wireworm. And that's a QR code. You can scan it. They should take you to the publication directly. Otherwise, just put in University of Idaho wireworm. Um, that publication uh, guides you through sampling for wireworms, also guides you to a key that you could use to identify the wireworm that you have in your field.
So now that we identify the most important species, we focus most of our future studies on these uh, Lemonius uh, group, uh, either as Californica or um, And uh, again, because uh, Californica is the most damaging species, and we, uh, we are, that's the most concerning one, and we focus on that species in particular. What people can do uh, to protect the crops, what we know so far is that if you have a high packed soil, a good packed soil or a high bulk density soil, that would reduce the wildworm pressure. Wildworms would not be able to move freely in a soil that is really well packed. So we always recommend to have a um, good uh, seeding bed uh, for, for your crop, whatever it is. So the, the, the more packed, the better it is. Plus, if you pack the soil, when you seed your crop, um, it has a good contact between the soil and the seed. And that would support the growth, uh, vigorous growth of your seed eventually. Uh, for some of the crops are more tolerant the, the, than the others. Oats appear to be resistant. Wildworms don't cause much damage to oat. I know it's not really uh, an organic crop, but barley is, uh, is an organic crop. And it seems to be a little bit more tolerant compared to the other crops that we have been dealing with uh, in term for, uh, when it comes to small grains. Uh, multiple years of alfalfa. Uh, it would make a big difference if there is any organic alfalfa production uh, producers among us. Uh, it shows that it would pack the soil and will again make the wireworm difficult for wireworm to move. And also rotation with uh, brassica uh, could be effective. And also brassica product, and I'm talking about a mustard to be specific, um, but we need to know a little bit more about mustard and I'm gonna be talking about that in the next slide, uh, it was quicker than I thought. So we have different species of mustard, but you could apply them to your field, either as plant tissue, plant mustard tissue that you uh, plow under at planting or right before planting. That's the best time to incorporate uh, uh, mustard into your uh, production system, into soil to reduce population of organisms uh, that you're not wanting to have in your field. But please keep in mind, uh, and also we have other products like seed meal, mustard seed meal, for instance, that you can apply. I think mustard seed meal is registered uh, for, for production, but now we are working on a, for organic production, but now we are working on a more, uh, um, what is it called? Um, uh, concentrated uh, compound that we're extracting from these uh, mustards. And I'm, the next slide that I'm gonna uh, show has that uh, in uh, the slide. But what I want to add here is that big, uh, take a close look at the species that you're applying in your field because that will make a big difference. Okay, if you use yellow mustard or they call it white mustard as well, uh, those are the ones that are most effective against your uh, pathogens. They are most effective against nematodes, against uh, other type of pathogens that you have in the soil. But if you really want to knock down population of insects, especially uh, wire worms you wanna use brown mustard. That seemed to be most effective. Oh, a lot of studies showed that. I mean, a uh, recent study that we did in the greenhouse, by we, I mean, Atusa did in the greenhouse, we also have seen the same effect. So uh, in this graph here, you're basically seeing the mortality of wireworms control, of course. Um, that's what this is survivorship, I think it's not mortality. I don't know if it was your graph or mine, but uh, this is uh, not wireworm. Mortality, this is why we're in survival. Okay, so we have controls that didn't really do well, but what you can see, no, wait a minute, that was correct. Let me correct that. No, it's, it's a okay. viral mortality. Yeah. That. Yeah. No, that is correct. So uh, here how it works. So the control is basically, uh, you applied nothing to it. So the mortality was low. So there is no, nothing, uh, uh, no mustard applied, uh, no seed treatment applied, nothing. So here in the other ones, we actually apply some sort of a treatment to it. And uh, here we had the wireworm only, we looked at it, wireworm survived really good. We only had a uh, low percentage of mortality at the end of the experiment. But look at when we used, uh, brown mustard, so Brassica juncea is a brown mustard. So when we uh, use our product, that a concentrated product that is not registered for uh, organic application yet, we, it is in the process, 
you could get up to 60%, higher, more than 60% mortality on these wire worms. When you use seed meals, you can get 30%, about 30% mortality. But um, uh, so those are actually effective. One of the things that we are still working on, but you can see that when we use uh, the yellow mustard uh, compounds on the wire worms, it was not as effective as the brown mustard compound that we used. Still, we got some mortality, but remember that it was in the greenhouse and we, um, we prevent the, um, the fumigates from leaving the pots by covering them with plastic. So it was a little bit more controlled than normal circumstances. So if you wanna control wire worms, use the brown, brown mustard in your field because that would be most effect, more effective. One of the options that we've got interested in because of our previous studies, and Atusa is gonna be talking about that, would be biological control. And the options that we had available to us to test, we had entomopathogenic fungi and we had entomopathogenic nematodes. And uh, we, uh, if you remember, I also talked about the physical, uh, components of the soil, the physical texture of the soil. We wanted to manipulate that as well in our studies to see if it would make a difference between, between the biological control uh, effectiveness of the biological control approach that we have. So in, in one of the first earlier experiments that we did in uh, uh, wheat and bar, in wheat, I think it was, we used uh, metarhizium. It is not registered in organic chemicals and uh, we, for organic experiments, we have replaced it with Bavaria. But uh, uh, the other compounds that we purchased from the market was Stratonema carbocopsi. That's a, uh, that's a nematode. And you're all familiar with diatomaceous earth. We know why we are using it. It's basically causing insects to desiccate. But the reason that we added this to one of our treatments was to see if you could facilitate penetration of fungus and nematodes into the insect body. Because if you remember, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, slide these wire ones are very, they have very thick skin. So it's very hard to get into their into their body. We manipulated soil texture with sand. Uh, we had soil with high sand content, and we also had soil with relatively uh, less sand content in order to make it more uh, look uh, more with organic matter or live, live plant tissues in it. This results that we found was kind of interesting. Uh, basically, uh, if you had nematode or nematode and fungus in sand dominated soil, they did relatively good. Otherwise fungus did the job better than nematodes. But what it actually showed to us is that the, the substrate that you're testing is gonna make a difference. And that's what we expected. And we thought maybe nematodes are, have the better ability to move in a sandy soil than to move in a soil that has higher content of organic matter, higher plant tissues. It may be because they're responding to uh, easier they can find the signals uh, of their host, you know, for example, CO2, other chemicals that their host is producing in a sandy soil that drains really fast uh, compared to a soil that has higher organic matter. But the bottom line is that sandy soils seem to be, nematodes did well in sandy soil, but they didn't do uh, as well in, um, in a high organic matter soil, but fungi, they did good, but fungus, did, did, uh, it, it did good. Um, Diatomaceous earth did not have the effect that we expected to see. I was hoping to see more efficacy of uh, diatomaceous earth when, uh, for, for nematodes and fungi when, uh, when we apply with diatomaceous earth, but that, but that did not uh, come out consistently. So uh, our conclusion was that it did not work as well as we thought. But he also helped us to uh, come up with uh, new questions and uh, uh, I'm gonna let Atusa to talk uh, on those questions later on, but I noticed that there were a few uh, messages popped up and I didn't have time to look at it. Um, can I look at those notes? Yes, we have a couple in the chat. And yes. so Diane Me? was saying that, um, you know, what she sees as one of the largest questions for home gardeners which I think would be the same for market gardeners, is how can they manage the pest and reduce populations and damage? And um, I think that perhaps the nematodes, because they weren't successful at Green Tree Naturals, Diane, were not um, a good option for your farm. And then the second question that Diane asked was, um, by brown mustard, what variety are you referring to? And is 
that something that somebody can plant? I saw that you were having a concentration that you said was not yet labeled, but if somebody planted a variety of brown mustard, would they be likely to see nematode, I mean, wireworm control? Okay, let me uh, look at the comments here. Um, Patricia, do you have the variety of the brown mustard? Because that's probably a question for you. The product that purchased. you used, yeah, it was Pacific Gold. Pacific Gold. That you used, yeah, for both plant and the seed meals and the extract. Okay. That, that's varieties that you're using in the university. Yeah. So uh, we will link the publication with the webinar. Okay. I think the big question for home gardener is how we can manage this pest and reduce populations and damage. We don't apply beneficial nematodes without success. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about that in the next few slides, but it seems that the fung fungus worked a little better. Uh, so I address Dan's your question by brown, uh, with brown mustard, uh, brown mustard variety Pacific. Okay, did we cover all the uh, questions? Yes, we haven't had any other questions or comments come in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, leave and go to my other talk, uh, but if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. If you type in my uh, last name or first name, either one, they're not that common. So, And then University of Idaho, my information will come up. So feel free to send me an email and I can give you more uh, 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 information on uh, just general topic and for a specific so two sides the person to ask uh, especially if you're interested to know uh, details of the purchase uh, and companies great oh, thank great. you so thank much you. all right okay. see you all bye bye, bye. so atusa if you would like to share your screen sure i'll do that right now okay can you see my can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And hello, hello everyone. And thank you for coming and attending in our webinar. And the first I'm gonna add, I mean thanks, special thanks to Diane and the other farmers, garden farmers that give me this opportunity to do my research in their farms. And now I'm gonna to share my re project results. So Previously, we talked about the so, biological contribution. Sorry, I, if I leave, yeah. I think your presentation is going to disappear. <laughs> so what? just a heads up, you need to put up your presentation again. Oh, OK. Yes. Yeah. I think you're I fine. See. I see you sharing your screen. Oh, yeah, she is? I OK. All right. screen. Yeah, you can just go ahead and leave it. We're good. OK. Sorry. OK. So yeah. We were talking about the biological control agents, entomopathogenic pathogenic nematode and entomopathogenic pathogenic fungi against the viable from greenhouse study. And so as we talked before, and Dr. Rasha talked before, we got a good result of nematode and the fungi to control the viable in the greenhouse study. But all of, all of us know that there are a lot of microorganisms that maybe are a natural enemies living in the soil and share their subterranean habitat with the wireworms and the other subterranean pests. So here, the, this question popped up that does any natural collected or field collected nematodes can reduce the viral population? So in this way, we collect the nematodes from the soil and again, reapply them in soil and see what effects on the viral. For address this question, we set up a greenhouse study I mean, last two, last two years. And for that, we collected the pathogenic toad from the soil of two heavy infested fields in the Southern Idaho. And for that, we started collecting the signs from soil samples from the fields and transfer them to the laboratory and put some wax worm on them. You can see here, there are the wax worm, Galeria melanola, that, which are a very good bait and uh, Food for the viral for the nematode to go through that and feed on them. So we put some wax form in the soil container and nematode go through the through the insect body, kill them, and after two or three days we collect the dead uh, insects and put them in the 
some traps we're calling white traps. And this is including the two different sized petri dishes, the small petri dishes, put in the big, big petri dish but, and put some water on it. And the nematodes are living through the uh, dead body of the insects and then starting to feeding of the nutrients of the body. And when they're all the nutrients through their body finish, they start to coming out. You can see here, there are thousands of, of the nematodes that are starting to getting out from their uh, insect body and go through the water and uh, leaving the, through the water. And we collect this water with the nematodes and using them and storing them as a local nematode to use in their own experiment. Also in this experiment, we want to compare the efficacy of the locally nematode, collected nematode versus the commercial available nematodes. We uh, use two different species of the commercially available nematode, which was Styronemus cavocatsi and Heterodactyus bacteriophora, versus two uh, locally species nematodes that we collected from the soil. And we want to compare the efficacy of both of them in the greenhouse study to. Um, to see how they can work to control the viral. Here is the slide of the collecting the viral. We also collect the viral because it's very hard to rear them in the laboratory. So we need to collect them directly from the soil, from the field and use them in their experiment. And we use, we were used the solar bait trap, which is some bait that we're using the uh, mix of, mixture of this, uh, what's that? So, uh, what wheat and barley through the put them in the sand and in, in the soil and cover them with a plastic bag and after ten days we come uh, we're coming back and collect all the germinated seeds and the soil around the seeds and because uh, when the uh, seeds start to germinating the CO2 that they're in, in release uh, attract the waterworm to go through that and so we can just collect the waterworm from them so we collect the waterworm and using the small cone shaped pots in the experiment in the uh, greenhouse and put the sand dominated soil as Dr. Rashid explained before, sand dominated soil more favorable for the viral and as well as the nematodes to go through that and their efficacy is better than the sand dominated soil. Put one viral on each of these pots and apply two species of the locally nematode, collected nematode, and two species of the commercially available nematodes in each pot. And after 12 days, we terminated the uh, experiment and recovered uh, recover the wireworm to see their mortality rate of the wireworm and how these treatments affect the wireworm. So after the result, analyzing the results, we got that this is one of the, uh, locally collected species, we call Steinem of Felte, and this is the, I mean, isolate of the species. And you can see here, these species ca cause the higher mortality in the viral compared to two different commercial species and the other uh, what's that, local species. And here in the picture is a very, very cool picture, infected viral with the nematode, and you can see when we cut the wireworms, all the nematodes came out from their body and so it caused it killing the wireworm. It was a very promising result that we got in the greenhouse study. And it shows that the yeah, naturally occurring nematodes because they're living for a long time in the soil in the same subterranean habitat with the wireworm. So they have a better adaptation to the environmental factor and the soil characteristics. So they, may work better to go through the viral body compared to commercially available nematodes. Giving this idea, we, we think about the control of viral and reduce the viral population in organic, organic production system, because you know, as you, all of you know, it's very hard and challenging work with viral and control the viral, especially in the organic farming, because we don't have any chemistry to control the viral. So, we need to rely on biological and the cultural control, control methods to control them. So we proposed a project collaborating with the Diane and the Dr. Rashid. And we were thinking to use 
both natural UR carrying nematodes and also combination of the nematode and the fungi to see how this combination and how this natural UR carrying nematodes can work and reduce the viral population. For a start this experiment, we, uh, we had three study sites. The first problem was the green two natural certified organic uh, or that organic farm, which was green uh, Diane's farm. And the second one, it was the University of Idaho organic farm. And the third one that we selected, it was Poki Creek certified organic farm in the San, San Mari. So we had three locations in two, three different fields. And first of all, we start to collect the, the nematodes from the, the San, I mean, from the farm. And before planting, we start again, say, get the soil samples and through the transfer them to the laboratory and start, and using the wax form and collect all the wild nematodes, uh, field collected or native nematodes from the sand from each different location and rear them in the greenhouse and the laboratory and again use them and reapply them for apply them again through the field to see how the efficacy of them against the viral. So here, uh, is a picture of one of the or field locations, the University of Idaho Organic Farm. And we had six different treatments. First of all was the commercially available nematode, which was the Eschdianum of Feltae, and locally collected nematodes, fungus, Pisabovaria barziana, that's, which is uh, registered for the using in the organic farm. And also we had two different other treatments, combination of fungi and the commercial nematode and fungi and the local nematode. And finally, non-treated control. And for non-treated control, we just spray the water in the field. In each third location, we had six, uh, five to six replicates per each plot. And we had six plots in each row. And uh, we applied, we planted black bean in each plot. The treatments, all the treatments applied at the planting. I mean, when we start the planting, we just apply the treatments, fungi and the, the nematodes in the furrow and then water them and cover them. And so start the, uh, getting data and collect the data after the planting. Here is the data that we're collecting. We want to, first of all, we want to evaluate and assess the viral population in the field. So we're starting sampling the viral uh, right before the planting to see how is the population of the of this of the viral in this field before the planting, and we're using the uh, cereal bay trap. And also after harvesting, when we finish the all growing season, we harvest the plants. We again start the trapping and collecting the wirebones to see how many wirebones after this applying this treatment is in each plot. And also in the second one, we use the uh, um, carrot as a bait trap because Diane has a good experience to collecting the wirebones with the carrot, so we want to uh, check, see if the carrot is effective or not. So the collect the wirebones, count the wirebones just before the planting and also after the harvesting to see applying these treatments, how effective wirebone population in, this, in each plot. And here the graph of the shows the results of the wirebone counts in all three locations that we had. You can see here in this picture, commercially nematode, available nematode, cause a higher mortality. And you can see here the low number of the viral we, we got in the after the harvest, I mean, comparing before and after harvesting, we got the lower number of nematodes, uh, sorry, viral in the plots that we applied commercially nematodes compared to control. And also local nematode and the fungi was relatively effective compared to control, but not much as commercially available. But interestingly, we got the results. I mean, the results shows that the combination of the fungi, local, and and the nematode, I mean, was not effective as we thought against the control of viral. 
We don't know exactly the answer of this question, maybe because of the environmental condition uh, has effect on the efficacy of these agents. Maybe combination of these two, combining of these two has some antagonistic effects that cover the effect, individual effects. So we're working on that to see what, what was the main reason that we got the, I mean, hard, I mean, no good results in combination of them. But uh, here for now, commercially nematodes, which was Sharnam of Fete, got the good results here to reduce the waterborne population. And also we counted the number of the plants right after germination, two weeks after germination, we count all the plants that emerge from each pot. And also at the end of the season, before the harvesting, again, we start counting the plants that they are mature and ready to, to harvest to see how difference between the number of the plants are getting match, mature and the number of the plants that emerge at the first of the season. And it shows that the trend of the damage of the waterworm through the season. So uh, after analyzing the, all the data, actually there was not any statistically significant difference between all of them, but, but take a look at this graph shows that the commercial nematode that caused the higher mortality in the waterworm shows the higher number of plants that get matured or shows that the lower damage of the waterworm in this plot compared to control and compared to other treatments. And it shows a good result for us means the efficacy, good efficacy of the commercially available nematodes against the viral. At the end of the season, we harvested all the plants and removed the pots, I mean, bean pots and put them in the greenhouse to dry them and then wait the, all the dried pots from each plot and combine all three locations to get the crop yield and see how these treatments, applying these treatments effects on the crop yield. And here, interestingly, you can see the, the plots that treated with the commercial nematode, the Steinem of I mean, relatively showed the higher uh, yield crop compared to control and compared to other, other ones. Fungi and the local nematode was relatively effective, but not much as the commercially available. So it's interesting for now, based on our results and based on the, the, the or data that we've got the, from the field, it shows that the Eshtarinema felti relatively effective against the control, against the viral in organic farm. But you know, these kind of field experiment trials, uh, we cannot, we cannot, I mean, say for sure that it's a uh, promising results. We need to repeat it in the other season to see uh, to see it's still effective or not because there are different environmental factors, soil texture, other organisms into the soil that may, I mean, react to the efficacy of the commercial I mean, nematodes or the fungi, and they need to repeat it next growing season to get a good result. But the main question remain, still remains that do, do apply biological agents remain active in the soil after harvest? And it's very important for us and also for growers to see when they apply some living, I mean, some live agents, so that, so that fungi or nematodes, they can establish in the, in the soil and they can be, remain active through the soil and uh, what's that? And, control the viral or other subterranean pests. So for answer this question, we collected soil samples, two samples from each plot after the harvesting and transferred them to the greenhouse, to the laboratory. And by putting the wax form on each plot that we applied fungi or the nematode, we got a good results and showed that in the plots that we applied the nematode, either local or the commercial ones, all the viral, all the wax form that you put in the soil still get effect, infected. So it shows that, yeah, after, so after harvest, there are some nematodes active into the soil, as well as the fungi. You can see it's a very cool picture here. These, these worms, these wax forms infected by the fungi and completely covered with the 
uh, I mean, fungi, mycelium, and kill the, kill the bags for, and for also for the fungi treated, treated plus, still we have some uh, fungi, some the uh, spore of the fungi active through the soil, and this is a promising, I mean, result for us. And also we want, we need to know that will they remain as effective till next fall, following season? And we can just be effective against the uh, pest through the, through the soil next following season or not? And to answer this question, we need to repeat this experiment in the fall, in the next growing season to see the efficacy of these uh, biological agents that we apply. And for the next step, first of all, we need to confirm or field results with the greenhouse because in the greenhouse we can just monitor and we can we can just monitor some environmental conditions, some soil texture. Uh, first, repeat first block of this uh, experiment is already done, but we what we need to repeat it two or three times again to can find the good results and a good number of uh, I mean power for statistical analysis. And for that. We uh, take some soil from organic farm, from the Diane's farm, and we brought them to the uh, greenhouse, autoclave them to make sure that we kill all the microorganisms that are living in the soil and may affect the efficacy of the nematode and the fungi. And we put them in the tubes with the wireworms, the planting one black bean, and applied all the treatments to see how it affects on the environmental and the uh, uh, in, uh, I mean, in the control condition. And uh, as soon as we got the uh, other blocks get done, we I mean, publish the results. And also the most important step that we need to finish it is evaluating the biological control persistence and uh, I mean, efficacy in the next growing season to see how they can remain active and how they can control the viable. And this was my results of the project. And thank you for attending. So and we are here for questions if you have any. Thank you, Atusa, for that presentation. Yeah. So um, perhaps sir, we are just a little bit over noon. So I just wanted to maybe address one question with you and Diane uh -huh. both answering. So what I understand is that there's some promising results from the commercial nematodes and that you're going to be looking at whether or not they're persisting, what's going to happen next year after applying them. So are you seeing that this biological control in the mustards are the two most promising ways to control wireworms in a market garden situation? Or are there other methods that weren't discussed today that growers or researchers are also looking at? So, you know, it's actually control the warworm is a combination of the methods. So we got good results of commercially, I mean, Echternum of Feltea species, nematode species, till now to the greenhouse and the local nematodes, to the, I mean, to the field and the local nematodes to the greenhouse. But I want to say that we need to combine some cultural methods soil preparation and tilling and the other cultural methods combined with the biological controls to get the good results. So because wireworm is a very tough pest with a tough body and it's hard to control them in just one, one approach. And also, uh, yeah, the most uh, product, as Dr. Rasha said, has a good result. I mean, brown mustard as a bio as a bio insecticide in the in the uh, organic farm but it's not registered now but it's in a process of for registration for the board and it would be a promising approach to control them too i would say great thank you diane do you have anything you would like to add no i think we're we're going to continue exploring different options the the area where we have the main infestation we're going to leave that out of production, we will probably plant it in um, Pacific Gold mustard this year. And if the infestation is not reduced, we might just fence that area off and put chickens in there because they'll scratch it down and eat everything that's there. That would be our, our, our next step. 
Great, thanks. Well, that's definitely another kind of biocontrol, right? Looking yeah. at a predator species like a, <laughs> a chicken. Okay, well, thank you all for presenting today and giving us an update on this research and helping us understand a lot better wireworms and some of the conditions where they do flourish and potential control methods. So we look forward to seeing how this research evolves over the next year. And hopefully we'll be able to get an update next time, um, next winter when we do our webinar series again. So for all of you that participated today, thank you very much. When you leave the webinar, you will receive a request to complete an evaluation to let us know a little bit about what you learned and what else you would like to see in our webinar series. And again, the webinar will be posted with the slide deck and the publication that Dr. Rashed referred to at this website, cultivatingsuccess.org forward slash recorded webinars. The other webinars that are upcoming for March next week, we're going to be talking about organic orchard pest management with Kyle Nagy from the Sandpoint Organic Agriculture Center. And then on March 30th, we're going to be talking about white, white rot in garlic. So we hope that you can join us for those webinars and do remember that they are recorded. So if you miss a webinar, you can view them from our website or YouTube channel. With that, thank you very much Atusa and Diane for being on today. We appreciate your presentation and we look forward to learning more as your research progresses. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of your help and opportunities. Thank you everyone. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Have a good day.